The next case on the docket is in Ray TM. Each party will have 15 minutes to present their argument. If I may reserve five minutes for rebuttal, how long would you like to reserve? Three minutes, Your Honor. Three minutes? Yes. I will be keeping track up here. So you have no way of seeing this. I'll let you know there's about a minute left of your time. And then when your time is up, I'll let you know you're in your rebuttal time and you can keep speaking if you want to, but of course we'll come off your rebuttal time at that point. And I'll try to let you know, Counselor, if you're about a minute left in your time. Thank you. Guardians will be recorded when you present your argument. Please stand behind the podium. We're visually and audibly recording, so please try to stay fair so we can hear you. Introduce yourself when you come up, please, each of you. We know we have one child in this case, TM, so please use initials and not the name of the child in this case. Go ahead and have your child come up, please, use their initials as well. Having said that, the court is ready to brief and ready to proceed whenever you are. Good afternoon, Your Honors. May it please the Court. My name is Lauren Hammerton. I represent TM. TM is currently serving a life sentence at ODRC for her adult case from Cuyahoga County. She will not see the Ohio Parole Board until 2070 when she is 67 years old. This Court's decision today in this case will not affect that sentence at all. But that being said, here, and as was true in her first appeal to this Court, the Juvenile Court lacked statutory authority to invoke TM's SYO adult sentence for two reasons. First, TM was not serving the juvenile portion of her SYO sentence. And second, criminal charges were not pending at the time of her SYO invocation hearing back in February. For that reason, we ask that this Court reverse the Juvenile Court's decision invoking her SYO. For purposes of argument today, I'm going to focus solely on this first reason. Unless this Court has any questions about the criminal charges pending, we're going to focus solely on the part that she was not serving the juvenile portion of her sentence. She certainly was not serving her sentence, the juvenile portion of her sentence, at the time of her invocation hearing back in February. She was actually at ERC at that time, serving the adult sentence that she got, unrelated from Cuyahoga County. But our argument also is that she had never served the juvenile portion of her sentence. The Juvenile Court ordered that she be put on probation. They gave her a case plan with recommendations for services that she should engage in. And their understanding always that was because TM lived in Cuyahoga County that her case was to be transferred to Cuyahoga County. The Lorain County Juvenile Court attempted to transfer TM's case to Cuyahoga County several times, but that transfer was never effected. Cuyahoga County rejected the transfer of her case. The state agrees that TM was not on probation ever in Cuyahoga County. She did not have a probation officer there. She never had rules. She never checked in or even met. In Cuyahoga County, you're saying? In Cuyahoga County, yes. Where we disagree with the state is whether she was on probation, actually on probation in Lorain County. Our position is that she was not. She was completely sentenced, though. There was an order issued, yes. The order from the Juvenile Court in Lorain County was that she was to be put on probation, that case was to be transferred to Cuyahoga County. But that probation was to be effectuated in Cuyahoga County, which it never was. There was a probation officer assigned to monitor the transfer of her probation case from Lorain County to Cuyahoga County. But that does not mean that she was actually serving, which is the language of the statute, actually serving, was serving her juvenile sentence. That probation officer didn't give her rules to follow. She didn't check in with TM. She didn't monitor her compliance with any rules because she didn't have any rules. That testimony came out at the hearing from both the probation officer who supervised the transfer and the probation officer who supervised that probation officer. Does the record establish that she ever met anyone in the Lorain County Probation Department? The record establishes that she did not ever meet with anyone. The probation officer reached out to her mother, but they did not actually meet with TM in person. And when did they reach out to mother? Shortly after the case started or months after, or do you know? 
Um, it was a period, so from the time of the juvenile court order until the time that she was arrested in her Cuyahoga County case was a period of about two months. It was from October to December. Um, so she was not out in the community for very long. Um, but that's an important point here, is that Lorain County Probation learned about TM's adult case in Cuyahoga County. They knew that she had been charged with very serious offenses. They didn't do anything. They didn't file a probation violation because she was not on probation there. So that testimony was sussed out at the hearing that if she would have been, that argument was made, if she would have been on probation in Lorain County, had they learned about these new charges, they would have filed a probation violation, but they didn't because they didn't think they could because she was not on probation. They had Did some, anyone testify from the Lorain County Probation Department that she was not, in their view, on probation in Lorain County? Yes, two, two probation officers said she was not on probation in Lorain County. Um, they were there, like I said, to monitor the transfer of her case, to make sure that the transfer was effectuated, to make sure that her paperwork got sent over to Cuyahoga County. And obviously they were having problems with that. That's why they had someone from the court staff assigned to do that, it never happened. But they were, didn't have rules. She did not have probation rules to follow. You know, the, this is your curfew, you have to get a job, here's the services we're gonna make you get hooked up with. The juvenile court had recommendations to that effect, but those were not rules. Case plan was not the same as rules. Um, so I think this court is correctly recognizing that the SYO statute requires that a child actually be serving their sentence rather than just that order, which is what, what the state says is enough to meet that statutory requirement. Well, to some extent, though, it seems at least some of the terms would have been relevant. As I recall, there was a no contact order. Certainly, your client wouldn't be arguing today that the no contact order didn't apply to her because she had any probation rules. She would say, well, yes, that applied to me. So, so it seemed to me she was there's something going on here. There's orders that apply to her. The court issued, I think, Judge Carr indicated, some form of a final order and said, here is your sentence. It is yes. Different. We're not disputing that there was a final order in place. We're not disputing that the court issued that order. That happened. That's not what the statute requires. The statute, the SYO indication statute, 2052.14, says that the child is serving the juvenile portion of their sentence. We point to MP, we point to JS, we point to JP, where the courts, different courts, were looking at whether, you know, to expand the language to include just this order. Um, MP is the, the most specific one. There's not been a situation just like this, um, and I, I think it's because it's a very rare situation where a kid does not get sent to UIS who has an SYO. I've never personally heard of that. But in this very rare situation where there's a kid who's not sent to DYS, who has an SYO sentence, now we have to see, well, what counts as serving the juvenile portion? The state would, would say, it's just the order that enough, that's alone. That's a very liberal interpretation of the statute, a liberal interpretation which courts around the state of Ohio have not done. They construe this, and this has been, or this has been ruled again and again, that this, the statute needs to be strictly construed in favor of the, de the defendant, TM, here. Um, there's no reason to extend it to include orders alone. And why is that? Because what is the purpose of SYOs? Um, the purpose of SYOs is to give kids a meaningful shot at juvenile rehabilitation before they are then sent to the adult court. They have to have a meaningful shot to try juvenile court rehabilitation. They gotta mess up again, and then that's when they would find themselves in adult, the adult system. There is no way that what TM had here could be considered meaningful juvenile rehabilitation. There's certainly no world in which an order alone, especially a no contact order, could be considered meaningful juvenile rehabilitation. The spirit of the statute, and this court can look to JV from the, state, the Ohio Supreme Court, the spirit of the statute is to give kids a meaningful <coughs> shot. So there's no reason to um, extend the language to include orders alone. If the, if the legislature had intended that, they would have said, 
the juvenile is ordered to serve the juvenile portion of their sentence has been placed on a juvenile sentence. Um, one thing that I likened to in my brief, and one thing that I will liken to here, if there was an order issued that TM serve a UIS sentence, and that paper was sent out, journalized, all of that, she never showed up to the UIS. On the day that she was ordered to report, she went to somewhere else. No one would argue that she was serving the juvenile portion of her sentence. Even though we have a paper in our hands that says you have to go to DYS, she wouldn't actually be there. She wouldn't be doing it. Same thing here. There's a piece of paper. We don't, we don't dispute that. Um, but she was not actually serving the juvenile portion of her sentence, which is what the statute requires. Did that answer your question, Your Honor? It does. Continue. Okay. <laughs> um, and I guess you know this is the this is the crux of our entire argument. And I would also you know point out one of the inconsistencies of the state is they argue that she was in fact on probation in Lorraine County, which the testimony does not bear out. Um, but then it also says that the order alone is enough, and that meeting with a probation officer um, isn't actually a requirement. <laughs> um, so that in in and of itself is contradictory. You have to meet with a probation officer, you don't have to meet with a probation officer. When it comes down to it, what courts in the past have done have looked at the language of the statute and said, we are not extending this statute to encompass more kids. We are going to strictly construe the statute for what it says. Um, this statute here says, is serving the juvenile portion of her sentence, and she, she never was doing that. Um, unless about there are about any, a minute of time left. Go ahead. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions about the criminal charges pending, if this court has any. If not, we'll just rest on our briefing and um, reserve the rest of our time for rebuttal. Thank you. Good morning again. Mark Coz on behalf of the Lorraine County Prosecutor's Office. Um, our contention here is obviously the 2152-14 big E, one, A, and B, and whether or not, as uh, TM's representatives have made clear, whether or not she was actually serving the, 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 uh, her sentence. Um, uh, I would, one thing I would just start off with, just to say if she's serving and that to give her a meaningful shot, well, here's the problem why TM couldn't have a meaningful shot, is because when she was dispoed in October of 21, and the case was supposed to be transferred, uh, an arrest warrant already goes out on November 3rd of 2021 for her arrest. And then from in November 9th, an additional arrest warrant. And then she murders a cop in January. So the only person who impeded TM from a meaningful shot was TM. The arrest warrant was from Cuyahoga County? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, and, and was the Lorraine County probation staff aware of those and not meeting with her because of probation the warrant existed? Well, my understanding is, is what came out of testimony is that they were monitoring the transfer, but then what happens is, is they don't get a letter from Cuyahoga until December 6th that she is not going to be on Cuyahoga County. They're not going to accept the transfer because the charges she resolved in November, Cuyahoga didn't even put her on probation for those charges. Is that when probation attempted to reach out to her and got a hold of mother and did whatever they did? I, I am not exactly sure. I know that it's sometime at that point, it's sometime around then that they did reach out to the mother to get a hold of her. However, uh, based on TM's actions, she is out in public committing many crimes. Um, additionally, I would say that going back to that, courts do speak through their entries, Your Honor. I mean, um, if she wasn't on this disposition, then they couldn't have gone towards invoking the adult portion of this. Well, let me ask you this. At least, I'm not read the record. At least, appellant suggests that the record indicates that the probation folks of Moraine County said she wasn't on probation to us. Was that what the testimony was at the hearing, or would you disagree? I can't speak to those exact words or sentences. They said that she was sentenced to probation, and that the ultimate goal, if you look at the 1028 entry, which says on uh, line two, juvenile shall be placed on probation, supervision of juvenile shall be transferred to Cuyahoga County. Uh, there, as, as you also, Your Honor, pointed out, there was no contact. 
and there was a case plan put in place for her. So ultimately, she is on this sentence. I would equate this, and if you disagree with this analogy, but many times, Your Honor, you'll have an individual here in Lorain County who will get sentenced to probation, but as a hold out of Medina or Erie County, goes out there and then is sentenced to prison. And then ultimately, the judge there could either run a concurrent or consecutive, but if he runs a concurrent, while that guy's in prison, he's serving his probation sentence, unless Lorraine files something to toll it or anything. So, Your Honor. Well, those are adult cases, and here we have a specific juvenile statute we have to comply with. I so that, 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 that's different. I appreciate that. Yes, you could say here's the analogy in the adult courts. I don't disagree with you. But here, as the comment points out, we have to comply with this specific statute. Yes, Your Honor. And I would point out that the only thing that they pointed out that's the stutch to any statutory authority, as they pointed to, that was serving is that a meaningful shop, the only person that impacted whether or not TM could have a meaningful shop was her own self. Um, I know there was no questions with um, and again, their reliance on, as we pointed out in, our, in, in Ray Eccles, that the third district held when the child was placed in the UK through the on community control, that was, person was held to be serving that sentence. Um, their reliance on in Ray MP is completely, is not appropriate given the fact that the, they tried, they, he had had two, the child there had two sentences. There was the one SYO dispositional, and the one was not. The court imposed on the not. So reading that one, it would make total sense that, yeah, they weren't serving because they imposed on a different case. Um, looking towards the final, and to the final part of their, which wasn't touched on oral arguments, but E1B, whether or not there were pending charges, the state would argue that at the time, at the May 22nd hearing that invoked the adult sentence, that case was appealed, correct? It was appealed. This court correctly remanded that for it to meet the burden of the statute, which was meaning by clear and convincing evidence, not just have a probation officer testify. When it came back, I would argue that the Court of Appeals reversed it and put it back in its original position, Your Honor. And in that original position, there were pending charges because Ms. TM was not sentenced until the fall of 22. Um, Additionally, Your Honor, um, if you have any further questions, I'd be there. Seeing no further questions from the court, thank you. Thank you. You have a little more than three minutes for rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honors. Um, I have uh, just a few quick points. First, the state contention that the only person who impeded her probation in Lorraine County with TM is categorically false. No one was specifically assigned to monitor her as a probation officer. That testimony was from Mildred Gonzalez, who was a probation officer with the, the juvenile court. She testified no one was specifically assigned to monitor TM as her probation officer. Um, so we don't dispute the fact of her convictions and her offenses in Cuyahoga County, um, but it's not correct to say that she was not checking in with probation when she should have been because she was not told to check in with Lorraine County probation because she was not in fact on probation here in Lorraine County. Um, second, to uh, address the Eccles case, that case did not involve an SYO sentence at all. It actually was a double jeopardy case. Um, in that case, the child was involving a transfer between counties. Child was placed on probation in County A um, and was serving probation in County A. Then their case was transferred to County B, where County B issued another order putting that child on probation. Um, the, the Court of Appeals, this court, found that it, it wasn't this court, I'm sorry. Um, the Court of Appeals found that the first order was enough to be a final appealable order to place that child on probation, and thus the second order was an order made in violation of double jeopardy. Um, so we're not, the, the question in that case wasn't, you know, whether the child was actually serving their probation sentence. In fact, they were because they violated probation, which is what brought that child to the attention of the court. 
what we're saying here is that in Lorraine County, there was a final appealable order saying, TM, you are to be placed on probation in Cuyahoga County. We're saying in the real life world, that never actually happened. That actually happening what needs is what needs to happen for the statute to be met, the statutory requirement to be met. Second, and he is instructed to this court. It's a, it's a case out of the 8th District. In that case, there were two sentences, two DYS sentences given to that kid. On the same day, the kid received a dispositional order for one case that had an SYO and one case that did not have an SYO. The child went to DYS and was serving time on the non-SYO case first, followed by the SYO case. While the child was serving time on the non-SYO case, the state tried to invoke his SYO, and the 8th District said he was not serving the, SY, the um, juvenile portion of his SYO sentence. And that's instructive because if the order alone was enough, then that, that case would have come out a different way. So, well, you have this order for an SYO case and you're serving a juvenile sentence, that's enough. But it wasn't. And that's why it's instructive to this court, is that it's not the order alone that's enough. We don't dispute the existence of that order, but the child has to actually be serving the juvenile portion. We just, we, the, none of the facts and the testimony show that TM was serving in real life her probation sentence, um, and thus the, the juvenile court did not meet its statutory requirement. So if I could just interject. Sure. So your argument is, um, the statute says, is serving, so there has to be some, um, you know, affirmative act that's taken to implement her sentence. And let me just interrupt and say your, your time's up for about Sorry. Please, that's okay, please answer Judge Carr's question and briefly. Yes, Your Honor, that's my, that's my answer, yes. Okay. There has to be something that is done either on the part of the kid or a part of the court that has to show that they are serving the sentence. And I don't think it gets into a slippery slope because it's very easy to tell what kids are on probation, what kids are serving probation, and what kids aren't. What kids are at BYS and what kids aren't. Thank you. Thank you. I thank you both for your presentation this morning. On behalf of the court, the court will take the matter under advisement. We'll issue a decision in due course. When that decision is released, it will be mailed to you by the court and closed on the highest Supreme Court website. With that, the court is now adjourned.